Lesson 5. On this lecture, we are going to talk about eukaryotic microorganisms, and those are going to be uh, fungi or fungi and uh, protozoa. And after that, we'll talk about helminths, means parasitic worms. And at the end of this lecture, we are going to talk about arthropod vectors. As I said, uh, we're going to cover two groups of eukaryotes, uh, fungi and uh, protozoa. Let's start with fungi or fungi group. General characteristics. Uh, you've already know that all fungi are scavengers because they obtain nutrients from decomposing organic materials. You're also supposed to know already that there are non-phototrophic means they do not use a sunlight as a source of energy. They are absorptive, they absorb nutrients from solution. Uh, so uh, are they pathogens for humans? Uh, means uh, can they uh, cause infections? Yes, uh, fungi of course can cause fungal infections and uh, for healthy individuals most of those infections are not life-threatening. They are stubborn, they are sometimes very difficult to cure and uh, we will talk about why a little bit later on this semester but as I said for healthy individuals with the healthy strong immune system fungal infections are not life-threatening. But everything has uh, suddenly been changed uh, after we started having patients with AIDS. Uh, we call those patients immunocompromised patients. Uh, we already talked about the fact that those patients actually do not die from HIV infection. Uh, patients with AIDS die from complications caused by uh, HIV infection. Why? Because HIV virus completely destroys eventually their immune system. So for those group of patients, fungal infections are deadly and life-threatening and most of the times they are the main cause of death for those patients. Next, uh, let's look at this uh, very nice chart uh, which uh, compares uh, main characteristics of fungi and uh, bacteria. Let's start with the cell type. We know fungi are eukaryotes, bacteria are prokaryotes. Next characteristic, cell wall. Bacterial cell walls are made of peptidoglycan. Very specific structure can be found only in bacterial cell walls. Fungi have no peptidoglycan, of course, in the structure of their cell wall, but they have very specific for them, structure that substrate that's very specific for them. We call it chitin. Chitin is a cellulose-like structure that maintains shape of the fungi. The next characteristic, uh, spores. Bacteria can form what we call endospores. And uh, remember I told you bacteria start forming endospores when environment is not favorable for growth. Fungi also produce different types of uh, spores, but those are different kind of spores. Those are what we call reproductive spores. The next characteristic is metabolism. We already talked about the fact that bacteria can have different group of bacteria. Different groups of bacteria can have different type of metabolism. They can be aerobic, they can be anaerobic, they can be microaerophilic. Fungi also are heterotrophic. They can be either aerobic or facultatively anaerobic. So there are two types of metabolism can be present in fungi. And the last characteristic is sensitivity to the antibiotics. 
To treat bacterial infections, we use antibacterial drugs. We call them antibiotics. And as an example, they use penicillin, tetracycline, aminoglycosides. Of course, those antibacterial drugs will not work against fungal infections. Why? Because fungi, remember, are eukaryotes. They have different structure of the cells. So to treat fungal infections, we're going to use antifungal drugs. And as an example, we can use, for example, imidazoles here on the slide, griseofulvin. Let's talk about structure of uh, fungi. And let's start with the yeast. Uh, yeast is a single cell oval shaped fungus. Molds and mushrooms are made of mycelium, which is a multinucleated mass of cytoplasm. Uh, the structural unit of mycelium is what we call hyphae. Those are individual filaments and when those hyphae filaments get connected to each other, they form what we call mycelium. All fungi can be divided into two groups based on the structure of mycelium. The first group is called lower fungi or Sinocytic. In the lower fungi, mycelium is undivided. There are no septum inside of mycelium. So that multinucleated mass of cytoplasm can freely flow inside of mycelium. Second group we call higher fungi. Higher fungi have septa within mycelium. But please remember that septum is not solid. There is always opening in the center of that septum. So once again, multinucleated cytoplasm can freely flow inside of mycelium. So once again, fungi is a group, consists of three groups of organisms. Those are yeasts, molds, and the fleshy fungi, and those are fruiting structures and the mushrooms. Let's talk about yeast once again, a little bit more details. And so, uh, as I said, yeast it is it is a unicellular fungus, one cell organism. You also have to know that it reproduces by budding means it forms buds on the surface of parent cell and here on this picture you see this is a parent cell and this is a new bud that is formed on the top of the parent cell. On this slide you see two pictures of uh, molds. On the left picture you see um, uh, how molds look like under microscope. You see a high fee structure of the molds. In the right uh, picture of this slide, you see how molds grow on a petri dish. Uh, when molds grow on a petri dish, uh, they usually form a fuzzy or woolly looking uh, growth. Uh, one more term uh, you have to know that is related to yeast. Dimorphism. Dimorphism means ability of fungus to grow in two different forms. I told you, for example, I told you yeast is a one cell organism. And yes, within human body, yeast lives like a one cell organism because it is easier to move inside of us for that one cell organism. Plus, it has a lot of nutrients available, so it doesn't have to compete for nutrients. But as soon as the same yeast gets out of human body, it starts forming um, mycelium. It starts growing like a mold. Why? Because there are not enough of nutrients for that organism available in environment, so it has to spread and compete for those nutrients. So once again, dimorphism means ability of the organisms to exist in two forms, 
for example yeast can be one cell organism or start forming mycelium and start growing as a mold. Uh, next we are going to talk about fungal infections and uh, as you see we call them mycosis. All fungal infections can be divided into a few groups based on their location. Uh, the first group is called systemic mycosis. Usually they are deep within the body. Remember I told you about immunocompromised patients and the, the fact that in their system fungal infections go systemic, become general infections. So this is one of the examples of the fungal infections that usually affect immunocompromised patients. Next group, subcutaneous mycosis. In this case, infection is located beneath the skin. Cutaneous mycosis affect hair, skin, and fingernails and toenails. Superficial mycosis usually affect hair shafts. And the last group, we call them opportunistic mycosis. Uh, this is another type of infection, fungal infection, that uh, will affect immunocompromised patients. What do we call opportunistic microorganisms? Opportunists are part of our normal biota. So they are part of our normal flora. They live on the, our surfaces as a normal flora. But when they're given opportunity, they can cause infections. So once again, because immune system of immunocompromised patients is damaged, it destroyed, of course opportunistic, opportunistic fungi are going to cause opportunistic mycosis. <laughs>